Hi, welcome to part two of my guide slash review of the Solo Adventuring Toolkit. And before we begin, I wanted to inform you that the author, J. Evans Payne, has told me that he has updated the document. If you want to see the complete list of changes so far, please check out the pinned comment in part one of this guide and review. This time we are going to talk about the quick start section. This is a very important section in my opinion. It serves as a platform, as a launch pad to begin your solo adventures. Some people could feel a bit overwhelmed because of all of the tables and the options in this toolkit. But with this quick start, beginners are going to find an easy way to set up a quick solo adventure and veterans will have a solid base to build upon using the information, the tables, everything when it comes to the content of this toolkit. So let's get started. This solo quick start allows you to quickly and easily generate a dynamic, interactive and interesting dungeon crawl without a dungeon master or a game master to direct things. I am going to be reading important points concerning the ways on which you can use this adventure site generator and I will comment on them. So first you have information on what is a solo quick start. This basically represents a singular achievement. Truly prepless solo gameplay with absolutely zero time required to invest up front. So you are basically going to be generating an adventure site. It doesn't necessarily need to be a dungeon. It could be a haunted castle. It could be a mysterious mansion. It could be some place in the wilderness, perhaps a set of trails through a swamp. Perhaps there are some roads or some passageways through mountains or hills. It could be any sort of site. So it's very easy for you to start playing your own solo adventure. You roll up some characters, or you take some pre-made characters, and you start building the adventure site. Many prepless Game Master tools offer expansive and sometimes thoughtful treatises on the nature of game mastering, the role of players versus dungeon masters, and all manner of meta-topics related to the game and how it is played. However, most such tools fall short of actually providing a framework that lets you instantly play with zero preparation or further thought or consideration. The solo quick start has been developed specifically to do exactly that. So in a sense, this is going to feel a bit like those dungeon crawl board games, although there is more detail to it, to the entire process because of all of the tables. It's not going to feel like Castle Ravenloft, you know the uh, Castle Ravenloft board game or similar games in which you are just uh, drawing tiles and a monster appears or an encounter. Here there is more detail, more possibilities and more randomness. Now, how do you get started with this? To jump in, you need the Flextail Solo Quick Start Guide, that is this uh, initial part of the document. As stated earlier, you need your characters, but also a beast theory because there are going to be non-player characters, monsters and the like inhabiting some of the sections of this adventure site. Some veterans or experts could be thinking that perhaps this is too basic, but the important thing to consider is that you can use all of the other material, all of the other uh, tables in this framework. This quick start section serves as a framework. This is not just about generating a dungeon. This is about creating a skeleton for the entire adventure. If you want to use some of the other oracle tables included in this adventure toolkit to begin the adventure, you can also do that. You can start with an event. But if you want to start with an adventure site, this is the perfect way to do this. And even if you start with an event, maybe something that happens during the course of the storyline, maybe events take you to an adventure site. So there is always that to consider. Then you have information on the flex tail advantage. The enormous benefit of the flex tail approach is that this book is by no means limited to use in solo play. Any game master with any adventuring party 
can use it to quickly and easily generate an infinite number of different interesting, engaging and challenging dungeons, no two being the same, and each one scaled to the adventuring party your gaming group plays with. It is literally as simple as picking up this book, rolling a d20 and determining what happens next. Each roll takes the adventure in a new direction. It introduces a new foe, reveals a new challenge, and uncovers a new dungeon chamber. In fact, a few of my viewers have asked me how useful this document is if you are using it in traditional play with your group when you are running things as a dungeon master or game master with other players. Well, here you will find the answer. This is very useful for improvised adventures, but also if you want to take your time creating adventures before the session, you can also do that. So how do you generate the adventure sites? In a nutshell, the solo quick start guide works by having your dice rolls dynamically unveil a dungeon map and populating that map with adventure content. To begin, you roll on the flex table 1, the quick start map generator on page 29. You draw the result as the beginning of your dungeon and this is a dungeon room. It can be either a hallway or a chamber. Subsequent to that first roll, you continue to reveal the dungeon map one room at a time and follow the instructions in doing so. The adventure ends when you reveal a staircase, when your party is slain, or whenever you feel like it. If you set up a goal, maybe you're looking for some sort of treasure for a non-player character, then that's the deciding factor to end this particular foray into a specific adventure site. I think you are going to have a lot of fun creating random encounter tables with different monsters, beasts, non-player characters. Perhaps some of them are neutral. You could convince them to help you or just to leave you alone. I would recommend that most of them are hostile so that you have some exciting encounters, but that is combat encounters, but it's all up to you. It depends on what you want for the adventure. So, as I said, each time you roll on the map generator table, you reveal more of the dungeon that you have not yet explored. As you are moving through the dungeon, you're going to be adding rooms directly connected to the room you are entering from. It makes sense, you see in these images, that corridors connect to other corridors, exits to entrances and the like. The map shapes are shown with the connecting point at their bottom. That is, when you roll your result, you're going to have a particular orientation and you just need to adjust that to the direction from which you are entering. So if you are entering from the east and you draw a T section, then you just need to flip it to the side so that it makes sense with your orientation. And that's how you're going to be building this dungeon through these generated tiles. A general common sense rule for solo play is that whenever the roll result doesn't apply to the architecture or the environment or the terrain that you are generating, you should change the result, you should re-roll on the table. Because what if you enter this dungeon from the south entrance and there is no other entrance into the dungeon and you generate a result that takes a, a right turn or a sharp left and that would mean that there is another entrance from the south side. So it doesn't make sense, you were outside the dungeon and there were no other entrances. So in that case you would need to reroll to get another more logical result. This could also mean that when you are moving through the dungeon, maybe you obtain some results that connect entrances to places where there are walls. It wouldn't make too much sense, so you also need to ignore that result. But again, it's all up to you. I don't know how you want the architecture of your dungeon, to uh, make sense with the overall structure. So you are going to be moving your party of adventurers or your solo adventurer if you're running that sort of game uh, through the different uh, dungeon pieces as you reveal them. But you can also backtrack. Maybe you reach a dead end and you decide to go back. But each time you traverse known dungeon rooms, you should roll on the appropriate random encounter table every four rooms to see if something new occurs. Now, this is not mandatory. Maybe you do not need to roll on the random encounter table. Maybe you roll a d6 and if you roll a 1, 
then you roll on the random encounter table. Or maybe you don't want to check for random encounters every four rooms. Maybe you also want to determine this randomly. It's all up to you. Now concerning secrets, if you encounter a secret, you roll on the flex table 12, secret door, because secrets reveal additional dungeon rooms. Once you have defeated the potential elements of the secret door, being hidden, locked, and or trapped, you place a new room. You choose one of the edges in the room in which you reveal the secret that does not already contain a connection or a potential connection to another room. You change that edge to a hallway and you roll a new room however you normally would. And remember, if something doesn't make sense to you as you are generating the different halls, the corridors, the chambers, just go with what makes more sense. Keep in mind that the secret door table may result in additional adventure elements in the room that is revealed. Secrets revealed in a four-way room where there are no such edges may transport you diagonally. You randomize which direction the secret teleports you in. Now concerning safety within the dungeon, any map room that does not initially contain an encounter may be safe to rest in, but then again, it may not be. When attempting to rest, you roll on the encounter table that's appropriate for the room type. Perhaps flex table 2, hallway encounter, or flex table 3, chamber encounter. Long rests, full rests, or overnight rests, depending on the game that you are playing, require rolling twice on this table to ensure safety for the extended period. So you're going to be drawing your map, and because there is no fixed scale, that is, you could run this in a theater of the mind style, or if you want more precision, if you want like a grid using hexes or squares, you can also uh, come up with a number for a particular hallway, it depends on the size, of the dungeon. If you want a huge dungeon, maybe each corridor is about 20 hexes or 20 squares long. If you want a smaller one, maybe it's just 5 squares or 5 hexes. It's all up to you. A solo quick start adventure is a straightforward yet dynamic and ever-changing dungeon crawl. You can imagine your adventuring party, perhaps in a cavern, underneath a mountain, deep in thick enchanted woods, it could be any place, as I mentioned earlier. But for the purposes of introducing a quick, simple, and easily used approach to solo play that works across multiple fantasy RPG rule systems, or any rule system, although, like I said in, in the part one of this review, there are some fantasy elements in this toolkit, it's quite system neutral friendly you need to take into consideration mechanics and concepts that are used here to take better advantage of the toolkit. So for example, speaking of advantage and disadvantage, whenever there is some sort of element or table that calls to this feature, it's the same feature that you could encounter in a Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition game. Here they explain what it is. Most of you know what it is. An advantage means that you roll two dice and you choose the more advantageous result. And a disadvantage, you roll two dice, but you must use the less advantageous result. So it's quite simple. You also have ways of determining the difficulty classes. Traps, spells, diseases, locks, and more all have some degree of difficulty. This is measured using a difficulty class or DC. So this concept is pretty common. However, because different systems scale creature abilities differently as levels progress, and to ensure a dynamic but still level appropriate level of challenge in all scenarios, a separate table is dedicated to calculating difficulty classes for encounter situations. So this is great, and for example, if you are a fan of old school dungeons, in which you are never sure what sort of situations of difficult encounters you are going to face, this is a way to randomize things quite radically if you want if you want encounters that outclass the party or the lone hero by a lot and you will have to rely on other means to escape or to avoid the situation you can generate that quite easily now concerning enemy combat flex ai is a much larger topic and i highly recommend that you get the flex ai guidebook it contains artificial, rather complex artificial intelligence guidelines 
to represent the tactics and the strategies that the enemies are going to be using in combat and also in social situations. If you are encountering someone neutral or friendly or someone that is uh, quite hostile, the artificial intelligence there is going to represent any combat or social related situation. It's going to be one of the best books that you can obtain. Remember to check out the link in the description below. However, because this toolkit is such a masterpiece, you do not need that one. Here you have a summarized version of strategies and tactics that the enemies could employ. So here you have information on when to use these uh, tactics, the limitations. By making rolls on different tables, perhaps the enemy is going to perform a main attack or a secondary attack. Maybe the enemy is going to use some sort of item or ability. You even have a table to determine the target. If you have a party of adventurers, who is going to be attacked? The one at the front line? the one that is strongest in the party, the weakest one, perhaps the most wounded adventurer. You have a table to determine that. And then we have a considerably useful quick reference table. You have different uh, tables. Rather, it's a table containing pages of the different tables represented by icons. It would be great if you could click on these pages so that they take you to the specific tables, but that there is also if they add another button or hyperlink in each of the tables that takes you back to this quick reference table, it would be great because that way you could navigate quite quickly, quite smoothly between the tables and the quick reference uh, indication or, or reference. So you have the map rooms, the hallways, the chambers, uh, gems, coins. I am going to give you a brief talk of these different tables and some examples. Let's start with the quick start map generator. To understand these tables, you need to make sense of the color codes. You have colors divided in blue, green, orange, and well, I would say black, but it could also be considered like dark blue. And each of those colors represents a sort of difficulty for the dungeon or adventure site. So for example, if you are running a dungeon that is of um, easy difficulty, you should reference the orange color. When you make your roll, just uh, read the orange results. If you want a higher difficulty in the dungeon, then use the blue section, the blue results, if not the green results. And if you really want a challenge, although I don't really like this, uh, like I said, black or dark blue section, because you don't find any treasure. That is the treasure that you're going to be obtaining is going to result from the encounters that you face and overcome. But with the other tables, there is a small chance that you find some uh, a hidden or abandoned treasure in a chamber. And I really like those opportunities. Then we have the hallway encounter table. Maybe you find a trap or an obstacle or a secret. The chamber encounter is quite similar. And you could be thinking, how do you end up with these results concerning chambers and halls and all of that? Well, in the main table, that is the, the table to generate the map itself, there could be some results that would lead you to these tables. Some of these results will uh, potentially produce traps, treasures and encounters with hostile and non-hostile non-player characters. So it's all about making sense of the results of integrating them into the dungeon. You also have a table. What happens when you generate a dead end encounter? There's also a table to generate all sorts of traps. Although I highly recommend that if you are looking for more trap options and results that you get the uh, Flex AI encounter book. The link will be in the description as well. And I also recommend uh, Treacherous Traps. That's by another company, Nord Games. You should also check that out. The uh, review to that one is going to be in the description as well. But here, like in many other things concerning the solo toolkit, you do not need any of those books. Here you have color codes. If you are running Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, uh, Pathfinder 2nd edition, any old school Renaissance game or Dungeon Crawl classics, you have all of the information here concerning the uh, saves and checks that you need to make, the damage that you could potentially suffer from gas traps, acid traps, blade traps, pits, etc. All following the color code that I mentioned earlier to determine the difficulty. 
It depends on the sort of dungeon that you are running. So it's all here. This is a standalone toolkit. Don't forget that. You also have a table to generate the difficulty class. As I mentioned, it's divided using the block difficulty section that I talked about in, in part one. That is, you have um, an easier challenge with light blue, a bit more difficult with blue. Then you move to this peach color and then red. You also have a poison generator with the damage and the effects of the poison, of course. You also have an affliction generator. It's all related to diseases and curses that could be a result of the many changes throughout the dungeon, many encounters, events, many features within the adventure site. So you have your disease generator with results such as atrophy, uh, wasting, motor dystrophy, maybe you are infected with a necrotic disease or insanity or you end up with a narcolepsy or you end up blind. You could also end up with all sorts of curses that give you disadvantages to different ability checks, skill checks, saving throws. There's also a table to generate obstacles. So these produce some very interesting effects. They give you some ways in which to avoid them. But if you are unlucky, you will end up suffering some sort of damage or hindrance. So for example, we have cave in. You make a dexterity check to navigate the boulders or suffer bludgeoning damage and you are knocked prone. A critical failure doubles the damage inflicted as further rocks fall atop of you. Maybe you have the blocked result. You make a strength check to clear the rubble. On a failure, you need to roll on the wandering monster table because creatures heard you as you were lifting up stones and trying to clear the boulders and all of that. And with a critical failure, if the roll on the wandering monster table is no encounter, you re-roll once. There is also a secret door generator. Maybe the secret door is hidden, trapped and locked. Maybe it's only locked. Maybe it's only trapped. There are also treasure generators. You could obtain uh, weapons, coins, potions, gems, pieces of armor, all sorts of gear and mundane items even. And there are many different results that could be produced from the many, many different features from these tables. There is a combat encounter generator. It's quite basic. That is results such as kobold, zombie, owl bears. You could create your own tables. I think that would be best to further customize your solo adventure, but it's here as a handy reference. There's also a beneficial spell generator. We also have a damaging spell generator. And this concludes this part of the review. As you can see, this quick start section to generate an adventure site immediately could serve as your base to start your solo adventure. You could use the many different tables that you will encounter later on in this book to further build upon this adventure site. Any oracle that generates quests, yes or no answers with many yes and or no but, or um, ways in which you can determine the temperature of the adventure site, mysteries, side quests, it's all here. Just start generating those adventure sites. And as you become more experienced with this solo toolkit, then you introduce the other tables into your adventure site. And as I said earlier, you do not need to begin your adventure with this uh, dungeon generator system. You could begin things by asking some questions using the oracles, a bit more freeform, but you could also pretty much run an adventure where the characters awaken inside of this dungeon with no idea how they got there. Maybe they only remember that they were moving from one town to the other and they suddenly saw this flash of light in the sky and they ended up teleported into this dungeon and you're going to be generating the results as they are trying to find a way out. Maybe you are handling things in the style of Eye of the Beholder, you know, the old computer and Super Nintendo role-playing game from Dungeons and Dragons that starts out with the adventurers going into this very dangerous area and they get ambushed and the way back is closed, there is a cave-in and now they need to find a way out. That could be the objective. You could easily run a mega dungeon using this adventure site generator. 
perhaps when you encounter a non-player character, you could make a check uh, based on diplomacy or an ability check. It depends on the RPG that you are running to see if that non-player character is interested in uh, bartering. Maybe you can sell some of the things that you found in the dungeon and you could determine the merchandise of that non-player character by making some rolls in the treasure tables to see that maybe that character sells some potions or some weapons, armor, etc. So it's all about that. Consider this dungeon generator as a skeleton or a framework to further build upon using the other tables included in this solo toolkit. Thanks for watching this part of the review and if you have any comments or questions, please let me know. If something wasn't exactly too clear or not, um, there is something that you wanted further explanation on, please ask away in the comment section. I will do my best to address those questions and give you some further tips and advice. And thank you so much to those of you that have been supporting the channel by sending right through RPG gift certificates. If anyone else wants to further support the channel, the information on how to do that will be in the description below. Once again, thank you and see you later.